I believe that there are new hidden tensions that are actually happening between people and institutions. Institutions that are the institutions that people inhabit in their daily life. Schools, hospitals, workplaces, uh, factories, offices, etc. And something that uh, I see happening is something that I would like to call a sort of democratization of, of intimacy. And what do I mean by that? I mean that what people are doing uh, is in fact they are sort of with their communication channels. They are breaking uh, an imposed isolation um, that these institutions are uh, imposing on them. How are they doing this? They're doing it in a very simple way, by calling their mum from work, by IMing uh, from, from their office to their friends, by texting under, under the desk. The pictures that you're seeing behind me are people that I visited uh, in the last few months. And I asked them to come along with the person they communicate with most. And somebody brought a boyfriend, uh, somebody a father. One young woman brought her grandfather. For 20 years, I've been looking at how people use channels such as email, the mobile phone, texting, etc. What we're actually going to see is that fundamentally people are communicating on a regular basis with five, six, seven of their most intimate sphere. Now let's take some data. Um, Facebook, recently some sociologists from Facebook. Facebook is, I mean, the channel that you would expect is the most enlarging of all channels. And um, uh, an average user, uh, say, said um, Cameron Marlowe from, from Facebook, has about 120 friends, but he actually talks to, has two-way exchanges with about four to six people on a regular basis, depending on his gender. Academic research on instant messaging also shows 100 people on, on buddy lists, but fundamentally people chat with two, three, four, anyway less than five. Um, my own research on cell phones and, 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 um, and voice calls showed that 80% of the calls are actually made to four people, 80%. And when you go to Skype, it's down to two people. A lot of sociologists actually are quite disappointed. I mean, I've been a bit disappointed sometimes when I saw this data, you know, all this deployment just for five people. And, and some sociologists actually feel that, um, that, um, that it's a closure, it's a cocooning, that we're disengaging from the public. And I would actually, I would like to show you that if we actually look at who is doing it and from where they're doing it, actually there's an incredible social transformation. There are three stories that I think are quite good examples. The first gentleman, he's a baker, and so he starts working every morning at 4 o'clock in the morning. And around 8 o'clock, he sort of sneaks away from his oven, cleans his hands from the flour, and calls his wife. He just wants to wish her a good day, because that's the start of her day. And I've heard this story a number of times. A young factory worker who works night shifts, who manages to sneak away from the factory floor, where there's CCTV, by the way, and find a corner where at 11 o'clock at night he can call his girlfriend and just say good night or a mother who at four o'clock you know suddenly manages to find a, a, a corner in the toilet to check that um, her children are safely home then there's another couple there's a Brazilian couple they've lived in Italy for a number of years they Skype with their families a few times a week but once a fortnight they actually put the computer on on their dining table pull out the webcam and actually have dinner with their family in Sao Paulo and they have a big event of it and I heard this story the first time a couple of years ago from a very modest family of, of immigrants from Kosovo in Switzerland. They had set up a big uh, screen in, in their living room, and every morning they had breakfast with, with a grandmother. But Danny Miller, uh, who's a very good anthropologist who's working on, on Filipino migrant um, uh, women who leave their children uh, back in the Philippines, uh, was telling me about how much parenting is going on through, through, through Skype and how much uh, uh, these mothers are engaged with their children through Skype. And then there's a, the third couple. They're two friends. They chat to each other every day, uh, a, number, a few times a day, actually. And finally, finally, they've managed to put instant messaging on their computers at work. And now, obviously, they have it open. Whenever they have a moment, they chat to each other. And this is exactly what we've been seeing with teenagers and kids doing it in school, under the table, and texting under the table to their friends. So none of these cases are unique. I mean, I, can t I could tell you hundreds of them. But what is really exceptional is the setting. So think of the three settings I've talked to you about. Factory, um, migration, um, office. But it could be a school, it could be an administration, it could be a hospital. Three settings that if we just step back 15 years, if you, if you just think back 15 years, um, 
When, when, you, when you clocked in, when you clocked into an office, when you clocked into a, to, to a factory, there was no contact for the whole duration of the time. There was no contact with your private sphere. I mean, if you were lucky, there was a, there was a, a, a public phone hanging in the corridor somewhere. If you were in management, oh, that was a different story. Maybe you had a, you had a direct line. If you were not, you maybe had to go through an operator. But basically, when you walked into those buildings, it, the, the private sphere was left uh, behind you. And, and, and this has become such a norm of our, of, our, of, of our professional life, such a norm and such an expectation. And it had nothing to do with technical uh, uh, capabilities. The phones were there. But the expectation was once you moved in there, your commitment was fully to the task at hand, fully to the people around you. That was where the focus had to be. And, 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 and this is, has become such a cultural norm that we actually school our children for them to, to be capable to do this cleavage. If you think nursery, kindergarten, the first years of school, are just dedicated to take away the children, to take, make them used to staying long hours away from the family. And then the school enacts perfectly well, it mimics perfectly all the rituals that we will find in offices. Rituals of entry, rituals of exit, the schedules, the, the, the uniforms in, in this country, things that identify you, team building activities, team building that will allow you to, to basically be with a random group of kids or a random group of people that you will have to be for, for a number of time. And, and of course, the major thing, learn to pay attention. To concentrate and focus your attention. This only started about 150 years ago. It only started with the, the, the birth of modern bureaucracy and of industrial revolution, when, when people basically had to go somewhere else to work and carry out the work. And when, with, with modern bureaucracy, there was a very rational approach where there was a clear distinction between the private sphere and the public sphere. So, until then, Basically, people were living on top of their trades. They were living on top of the land they were laboring. They were living on top of the workshops where they were working. And, and if you think it's permeated our whole culture, even our cities, if you think of medieval cities, medieval cities, the boroughs are, have the names of, of the guilds and professions that live there. Now we have sprawling residential suburbia that are well distinct from production areas and, and, um, and, and, and commercial areas. And actually, over these 150 years, there's been a very clear class system that also has emerged. So the lower uh, the, the status of the job and of the person carrying out, the more removed he would be from his personal sphere. People have taken this amazing possibility uh, of actually being in contact all through the day or in all types of situations. And they're doing it massively. The Pew Institute, which produces good data on a regular basis on, for instance, in the States, says that, and I think this, this number is conservative, 50% of, of anybody with email uh, access at work is actually doing private email uh, from his office. I really think that the number is conservative. In my own research, we saw that the peak for private email is actually 11 o'clock in the morning, whatever the country. 75% of people admit doing private conversations from work uh, on, on their mobile phones, 100% uh, are using text. The point is that this reappropriation of the personal sphere is not terribly successful with all institutions. I'm always surprised that the US Army sociologists are discussing of the impact, for instance, of soldiers in Iraq having daily contact with their families. Um, but there are many institutions uh, that are, are, are actually blocking this, this access. And, and every day, every single day, I read news that make me cringe, like $15 fine to kids in Texas for using um, every time they take out their mobile phone in school. Uh, immediate dismissal to bus drivers uh, in New York if seen with a mobile phone in a hand. Um, companies blocking access to, to, to IM or to, or, or to Facebook. Behind issues of security and safety, which have always been the arguments for social control, in fact what is going on is that these institutions are trying to decide who in fact has the right to self-determine their attention, to decide whether they should or not be isolated, and, 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 and how, you know, and, and they are actually trying to, to, to block, in a certain sense, this movement of, 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 a, of a greater uh, possibility of intimacy. Okay.